Great, I'm so happy to see everyone. Um, and uh, I will say as somebody who gives talks on Zoom, I think if you're able to show us your face okay. so that the speaker can see the audience, it uh, gives a more homey feeling than staring at black boxes. If you can't show us your face for some reason, of course it's fine, but you're welcome to turn your video on. We would love to see you. Um, it gives me great pleasure this afternoon to welcome Cesar Hidalgo, who is the director of the Center for Collective Learning at the University of Toulouse. I may, he'll tell me if I've missed any part of his title. Uh, and his talk today will be on the principles of collective learning. Cesar has to get to another meeting, so this will be a slightly truncated talk, but we will have time for questions and then we'll have a few announcements at the end. So Cesar, please go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction. And, and I apologize beforehand, I had to teach at five and I had to teach on a different building. So that's a bit of the challenge that I have. You know, I have to cross, you know, uh, the channel uh, with the rain and everything. Um, now I need to have, okay, I have co-host access, so I should be able to uh, share my screen. And I would ask you just to confirm if you can see my screen. Great. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to tell you about the principles of collective learning. Uh, by the end of this talk, you're going to know about the basic laws that govern the generation and the diffusion of knowledge across time, across space, and across different economic activities. Here I'm going to be talking about knowledge, not from an epistemic sense, it's not, you know, knowledge about things, but it's the knowledge that is productive, you know, this knowledge that you use to make things, you know, this ability to make that we also call knowledge and that we would find, you know, in, in theories like, like in Paul Romer's, you know, endogenous growth model. But I want to motivate this with a story because um, the reason why we need to understand these laws of knowledge is because when we fail to understand them, uh, actually we sometimes fail to deliver what we promised. We have bad development projects that are bad, not because they have bad intentions, but because they ignore these principles. So I want to tell you the story of Yachay. Yachay was an attempt to create a city of knowledge in Ecuador. Uh, this was a project that was uh, relatively large, was a billion dollars. That's about 1% of the GDP of Ecuador. So it's a big investment for the country. And the goal was to create this city of knowledge that was going to have a science and technology university and many high tech firms around it that were going to transform the economy and they were going to make Ecuador's economy a knowledge economy, not an extractive economy. So it was a beautiful idea, but it was also a very romantic type of idea because when this idea was put into practice, the city of knowledge was not built on Quito or Guayaquil, which are the two main cities of Ecuador. It was built in a piece of agricultural land that was all more than two hours north of Quito, basically in a place that we would say the middle of nowhere, where there were no skills, there was no capacity. And of course, you know, the ability to create, you know, such a large project in a place that has not so much going on from the beginning, it's problematic. In a way, like knowledge doesn't grow anywhere. Knowledge grows according to certain rules. Knowledge accumulates in cities. Knowledge diffuses across similar activities. We've known a lot of these things, you know, uh, for a long time now in the literature that studies economic geography. But when it comes to these policy projects, this type of idea sometimes get ignored. And the result is that the execution is not as beautiful as the dream. You know, the execution falls short. And we end up with projects that are incomplete. In the case of Jashai, you know, many buildings, for example, you know, didn't pass inspection because they had faulty construction. Because of course, they're not only, you know, putting money to create the city of knowledge, you have to bring every worker, you have to bring every piece of brick, you know, nothing gets produced there. So it's a really risky, difficult project to execute. But this is not the only example, just like we have Jachai. In Ecuador, we have, for example, the Masdar Institute of Technology in uh, Abu Dhabi. This was also a project, you know, that was big. It was over a billion dollars. MIT was involved, and it was this idea of creating this city of science and technology in Abu Dhabi. But uh, this university is no longer there; it has been absorbed by other university. And once the initial thrust of funding disappeared, 
you know, these projects are unable to sustain themselves. So there is a, a pattern that, that you're gonna start to see that in developing countries and especially you know, extractive economies, you know, economies that are rich in minerals or, or other type of natural resources, they know that the way out of their predicament is to build a knowledge economy. So it's not that we need to convince the world that knowledge is important. It's that we need to understand how do we actually build knowledge? How do we actually create a society that can create knowledge? Because otherwise, we end up confusing knowledge creation with beautiful architecture. You know? And to me, this is the most uh, present example of that. This is a gorgeous building. You know? This is an uh, institute of research for you know, petroleum and gas in Saudi Arabia. You know, it's a building designed by Zeda Hadid. You know, and I, I have no problem with the architecture of this building. I, I would give it an award, it's, it's fantastic. But the problem is that buildings do not produce knowledge. It is people the one that produce knowledge. And you know, these big architectural investments that we see in Yachai, that we see in Abu Dhabi, that we see in this example, eventually do not uh, give us the fruit you know, that we're trying to collect. You know, so there's there's examples. It is the Boulevard of Broken Dreams. It's a book that also talks about all of these efforts that fail. And the reason why these efforts fail, you know, I'm going to argue is because there are certain principles that govern how knowledge is created. You know, knowledge doesn't just grow haphazardly. You know, and if you ignore those principles, you're not going to be doing good knowledge engineering. Just like you cannot build a plane by ignoring the principles of aerodynamics or the laws of gravity, you cannot build knowledge by ignoring the laws that govern how knowledge accumulates in time and space, okay? And there are three principles. Uh, the first is the principle of experience, which tell us about knowledge growing in time, okay? The second one is the principle of diffusion, which is about knowledge moving between geographies and between activities. And the third one is the principle of intensity, which is about a quantifying accumulations of knowledge, like knowledge that aggregates in a city or in a country, and how that helps us understand inclusive green growth. So let's get started. So the principle of experience, you know, was something that um, starts, you know, with the story of Leon Thurston. In 1919, this mechanical engineer that was pursuing a PhD in psychology uses data from a typing class at the Duff School of Business in Pittsburgh to measure how students learn to type throughout the semester. So every week these students had a test in which they had to type the largest number of possible words in four minutes, you know, and uh, they would be graded on, 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 on those assignments. So uh, Thurston had access to data that told them how many words these students were able to read in four minutes, how many mistakes they made and so forth. And over time, students got better and better. You know, we understand that with practice, we become better, but, but saying that with practice, we become better is not very useful because we need to, you know, uh, do these things in a, in, a, in a way that is a little bit more fine grained. How much better we get, how much more, you know, proficiency we gain for each unit of practice. And Thurston was among the first one in 1919, more than hundred years ago, to quantify this relationship and show that individuals learn according to the learning curves in which learning is stronger in the beginning and then it peters out a little bit at the end. So the, the last unit of practice doesn't give you as much learning as the first unit of practice does. Right? But then these ideas were brought into the, uh, into the, the space of teams. And here you have the work of Theodore Wright. Theodore Wright was an um, engineer that studied learning, in this case, in the context of aircraft manufacturing. And he found that, you know, as people manufacture aircrafts, also the same team with the same capital, the same skills, was able to manufacture aircraft better and better as uh, they moved on. And I think, oh my God, my computer just froze uh, and I have a beach ball spinning around. You know, so I'm gonna try to see if I can quit the share screen and if I can use that to fix it. I'm apologize for this. You know, um, uh, I'll, I'll 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 keep on talking as this goes. But like basically, what what Wright found is that you know what was true for individuals in the case of Thurston was also true for teams. You know, teams with the same capital, with the same number of people required less hours to build the same product, the same plane in this case. These were planes that were built you know, in preparation for the Second World War in this case. 
And that meant that those teams were learning, they were becoming better and better at what they did. So it reproduces this idea that knowledge accumulates you know, as teams become better. I completely lost. So I have a feeling that Cesar is in limbo with a lost connection. So I think he'll probably reboot and then we'll see him in a moment. So while we wait, why don't I make a couple announcements? Um, the next seminar in this series um, is called What is Feminist Data Science? A talk by Professor Lauren Klein from Emory University. And it will be on the 12th of January. So this is the last seminar of the autumn, uh, and we look forward to seeing everyone in January. Same time, 4 to 5 p.m. CET uh, on the 12th. In the meantime, um, I do want to announce one other event that will be held in December. On the 16th of December, from 2 to 5 p.m. CET, the Civica Network will host the first of four hackathons, um, where hackathon is uh, yet to be defined, but it, but it will allow people to uh, interact with data. Um, the first hackathon will be led by the COVID-19 Model Challenge Steering Committee, which I happen to be co-chair of. Uh, from, uh, we're based uh, around the world. The other co-chair is Alex Skako from the Vese Bay. Uh, and we will be running a hackathon where we walk participants through the uh, model challenge site and show you how to submit statistical models that predict future COVID deaths, both cross-nationally and subnationally for three countries, India, Mexico, and the US. We will reopen the site for a pedagogical initiative in January, at the end of January. And um, we, are, we will be providing pedagogical materials and allow classroom submission of models in the period basically January to June. So we in particular encourage anyone who might be teaching statistics or data science in that period to come to the hackathon so that you can get an idea of what the site does and the kind of statistical models that it um, um, allows so that you can consider potentially using it in a class. Uh, and, that, and we will be providing some pedagogical materials on the site to allow that. I see Cesar is back. And so- My apologies. We're so sorry, but um, let me turn it back over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. So le let's, let's get back, uh, right back on it. So uh, the principle of experience tells us that as we practice, we accumulate knowledge, you know, so we become better at things. And it was true for individuals. 
It is also, you know, true for teams, you know, as Wright showed. And, you know, it even accelerates when we look at industries. You know, so when we look at individuals and when we look at teams, we see that uh, proficiency increases, you know, as we practice more. But when we look at industries, we see that actually the growth is not bounded, but it's actually exponential, you know? So for instance, here you have Moore's law. This is a famous example of an experience curve, you know, which happens at a higher scale. It's not individual, it's not team, but it's an industry. You know, it's a very large macro scale, you know? And we see that the transistor count of microprocessors has increased over time. It basically doubles every 18 months, you know? And one question that you would have here is, well, how in a world in which individuals learn in a way that is limited and where teams learn in a way that is also limited, we can have at the industry level, when we go one scale larger, when we go you know, to this more macro scale, growth that is unbounded or seems unbounded, that is exponential, that doesn't seem limited. And the reason is that you know, uh, at this scale is the first scale in which we really find you know, like different groups innovating and developing new ways of doing things. So the result of this exponential growth is not that there is one team or one group of people that are getting better and better and better, but there's like new groups that are coming along with different techniques. So an example of this is, for instance, the reduction in the cost of light over the last, you know, 800 years. So you see here that you have like this curve in the beginning that like looks that it goes down and, and is limited, you know, between the year 1300 and then between 1600 and 1700, you don't see a lot of progress. And then you see another, you know, uh, decay. Well, if you look at this in log scale, you would see that actually there's a lot of these things going on because there are changes in technology that have different learning curves. So the first learning curve, you know, here you have the tallow candles and it reduces eventually the cost of producing a lumen of light, you know, but then you have gas and gas also at some point is gonna reach a limit of efficiency, but then you change to kerosene, to electricity, you know, with fluorescent, uh, first with incandescent, then with fluorescent bulbs. And each one of these technologies brings you down further. So you can have this exponential improvement in a world where improvement for teams and for individuals is limited because at this larger scale, at the scale of industries, or, or, or at the scale of society, you have innovation and therefore you have this so a sequence of learning curves, you know, that partly overlap, but then that go further. Here you have another example that is very strong. In this case is the cost, you know, to sequence a megabase of DNA, you know, and this used to be about like $8,000 in the year 2001. And you see that basically there is an improvement according to like some more curve, then there has changed in technology. And then there have been subsequent changes in technology that basically has brought, you know, this ability to different, you know, learning curves. And hence, you know, the net effect is that the improvement is, you know, exponential over time. It has improved a lot over time because of these changes in technology. So this is the first law, which is the principle of experience. And it's a law that is telling us how knowledge grows in time, you know, for individuals, for teams, you know, it tells that the unit cost of performing an activity decreases with cumulative, ex cumulative experience, but that, a decreasing cost is limited. But then we go to a larger scale, when we go to the scale you know, of industries, when we go to scales that are longer in time you know, as well, uh, we're gonna see that this growth doesn't appear to be as limited. And the reason is because basically we have different learning curves that are overlapping with each other and that allow you know, this performance increase to continue over time despite the fact that each one of those curves individually is limited. So that's how knowledge grows in time. You have to give it time, you know, and you have to understand that it grows differently depending on the scale the, of the, or your unit of observation, you know? But the thing is that tells us about how to do the same thing better, you know? So we are doing better computer chips or we are producing, you know, a lumen of light at a lower cost. But economists don't only need to learn how to do the same thing better they need to learn how to do different things. So this first principle cannot explain to us you know, how economies learn how to do different things. It tells us how knowledge accumulates in time, but not across activities, not across space. So uh, we need to understand how economies enter new products, new researchers, new occupations, new skills, because there's a lot of things that economies can do. You know, and a lot of these things might require very specific forms of knowledge that need to be accumulated. 
So in some way, we, we have kind of like a couple of alternatives. We could think that there is a world in which, you know, learning is not collective. Learning is just individual. It's just about practicing yourself, you know? And in that world, you know, what we would expect is that the probability that an agent learn or that a team learn or that a, a firm learns doesn't depend on the presence of having neighbors that have that knowledge, okay? So that would be a world, you know, in which learning is, is atomized. But maybe we live in a different world, you know, and I'm gonna actually show you evidence that we live in this second world, in this world of collective learning, in which the probability that, that you learn, that you enter an activity, that you become good at something, you know, is not something that is only intrinsic to that unit that is learning, it depends on the neighbors that have the knowledge around you, you know? Uh, so it could be a world in which these neighbors reinforce each other and the more neighbors, the better. It could be a world in which neighbors are a bit redundant. But the, the main point here is that it's not a world in which the probability of learning doesn't depend on the neighbors. It's not constant like on the left, but actually it's an increasing function of the neighbors that have knowledge like the case on the right. So who are these neighbors? You know, And there's a lot of neighbors. There's a lot of ways of thinking about neighbors. I'm gonna separate these ways of thinking about neighbors into two. I'm gonna talk about you know, geographic neighbors. And by geographic neighbors, I'm gonna be referring to them quite broadly. These are neighbors that are geographic in space, in culture, in language. You know, so we can say, for example, that Chile and Spain are neighbors in language, you know? uh, while you know, Spain and France are neighbors in space. You know, they share a border. Um, and also we have neighbors that are not geographic, that are cognitive. You know? So you might have activities that basically require similar combinations of knowledge. For example, producing shirts and producing pants might require overlapping sets of knowledge. So learning how to do one in the presence of the other you know, might be easier if collective learning is at play. So we have a lot of evidence of the first type, you know, of the, for the first world. You know, people have been looking at the geographic diffusion of knowledge. You know, and a classic paper in this literature is Jaffe, Trachtenberg, and, and Henderson. Uh, that use patent data. And in 1993, they show that patents tend to cite more other patents from the same geography than other patents that would be the same in terms of being from the same technology and being you know, awarded at the same time. You know? so, uh, and that this effect is stronger when you do it for more fine uh, geography. So it's relatively weak at the level of the country, it's stronger at the level of the state, and it's a fourfold increase you know, at the level of a city. So knowledge seems to be spilling over you know, uh, to places that are near you know, those places where the knowledge is being produced. You know? So there is this geographic concentration of knowledge. Knowledge you know, doesn't travel as far as we would like. Um, now, is this because you know, knowledge is, is, is heavy, cannot move across big distances, or is it because social networks are embedded on space? You know? In some sense, the people that share a city are also people that are more likely to know each other. So more recent work, you know, a decade later by, by people like Brescia and Lisoni, like tried to separate this. So they reconstruct the network of uh, inventors using, you know, this patent data. And when they look at people in the same, you know, uh, geography, in this case, LLS in that table, or that are connected because they have co-author or, you know, they have a co-author with someone in common and so forth, and they find that it is the connections, the ones that really explain most of the effect, you know? So these networks, you know, are the ones that uh, actually are driving these effects of knowledge diffusion. So knowledge is hard to move across space because networks tend to be highly localized, you know? And there's evidence for basically all of these channels, you know, geographic proximity matters. It matters even though social networks matter, geographic proximity still matters a little bit you know, on top of that. So it matters to be close in space, it matters to be connected, it matters to share a border, you share a language also. Of course, that uh, uh, facilitates knowledge diffusion. You have a colonial history, similar culture as well. You know? So there's a vast literature showing that all of these forms of geographic proximity matter, knowledge diffuses in space. You know? That's bad news for Yachai that was not close to any no knowledge intense location. But it's not just about space. You know? Uh, it's also about you know, cognitive relatedness. So around the, the, the year 2005, people in the economic geography literature you know, started to realize that uh, you know, in some way, you, know, you could have two cities that were close in space, but they do very different things. 
and they might not be learning from each other because your ability to learn from one another depends maybe on your ability to also uh, have knowledge that is related to the one that you need to learn. So in, in 2007, we published a paper in science that, that formalized this idea quantitatively. And what we did is we created these networks in which each node is an activity, in this case, a product. Activities are connected and they tend to be produced in the same places. And when we overlay the patterns of the specializations of activities, we can actually predict the activities that a location is gonna enter in the future because they are those that are cognitively related to the ones that they did in the past, okay? This is something that has been generalized a number of times. So now here we have, you know, uh, Nefke, Henning, and Boschma in 2011. They do this with industries in Sweden that tend to manufacture products in the same plants, the same finding. Here you have, you know, the same finding now using research data. Here each node is our research area. You know, those are connected if people tend to publish in both of them, you know, uh, and, you know, you can also use this to predict the areas that a scholar, a university, or a country are going to enter in the future. You know, so cognitive relatedness matters here as well. It matters also for technologies. Here you have technologies that tend to occur in the same patterns, and you can also use that to you know, predict the technology classes that you know, a country or an inventor is going to enter in the future. You know? So here is an example of that. You see the practice structure of Chile in 1979. These are all of the bright dots. You know, and the scaffold, the network behind it, you know, is the pattern of cognitive relatedness between all of these activities. And when you see the activities that you know the country entered between 79 and 1996, then to be near those patterns of specialization that they already had. So we live in a world in which cognitive relatedness matters. It's not just about having physical neighbors, but it's also about you know those neighbors in these cognitive spaces. You know, and this is something that now uh, in our literature, well, knowledge as a principle. You no, know, we actually wrote a paper in 2018 with a lot of important authors like you know Ed Glaser and Marian Feldman, you know, uh, in which we came together and we proclaimed this as a principle that was valid across a number of different scales. So it's true for cities, it's true for regions, it's true for countries, but also you know a principle that is true across a number of different activities. It's true for industries, it's true for uh, occupations, it's true for patents and so forth. So this is the second law. Let me, if I hear these French lights turn off if I don't move in the office. Okay, there, sorry about that. <laughs> so there is a second law that governs the diffusion of knowledge among economic activities that are cognitively related. And this law tells us that the probability of entering or exiting an economic activity increases or decreases with the presence of related activities, usually as a power, okay? So the number of uh, neighbors that do something similar uh, in a space or you know, in cognitive space you know, helps explain the probability that a location would enter an economic activity or that an economic activity would enter a location. You know? This tells us that the knowledge flows are more effective among geographic, demographic, you know, and cultural neighbors but also among cognitive neighbors. You know? So now we understand a little bit how knowledge moves. We know how it grows in time. Now we know how it diffuses in space. But you know, how much knowledge is there in Paris compared to Milan, you know, compared to Tokyo, compared to Shenzhen? You know? Can we actually quantify these agglomerations of knowledge? Because you know, we know that knowledge you know, grows and diffuses. You know? And we know that knowledge is very spiky. You know? If you look at a map of the world, you know, there are concentrations of knowledge. These are cities. You know, that have lots of knowledge and there are big places in between where there's little knowledge you know but the problem is that adding knowledge is hard you know when you have knowledge on how to make pants and you have knowledge on how to make shirts should you just add them is that twice the knowledge it's just 1.1 the knowledge is three times the knowledge how do you add knowledges you know so that's something that you know sounds a little bit funny but it's, it's really crucial in this literature because if you want to understand the geographic concentration of knowledge, you're going to need to, at some point, create some measures that allow you to understand what those concentrations are and be able to you know, add them by taking into account some of those redundancies and overlaps. You know? So we need also a principle that can help us understand this intensity of knowledge and the implications of these accumulations of knowledge. And the first thing I'm going to say is that, you know, well, it's easy to say what knowledge is not. Knowledge is not a thing. It's not like a fluid. It's not monolithic. It's not that you have more knowledge or less knowledge because knowledge is highly specific. 
is combinatorial, you know? So if you know how to play the piano and you know how to bake an eclair, you might not know anything about building a roof, you know? Knowledge can be very specific. So if knowledge is very specific, it's not something that we can simply add, you know? It has to be something more complicated because it's partly overlapping, it's partly distinct, you know? And, you know, it's all of this big puzzle that has lots of pieces, you know? But the pieces are not all distinct. You know, and we need to figure out how to add them. You know, so uh, for most part, you know, people basically have been dodging this question. So when you look at all of the work on the knowledge economy, we tend to take proxies. So we either take, you know, measures as, you know, the years of schooling of a population or the total number of patents, whether those patents are, you know, in furniture or whether those patents, you know, are in electronics, it doesn't matter. You know, a patent is a patent. So we tend to aggregate, you know, by making equivalent classes between units that might not be equivalent, you know? Or we take proxies, for example, we say that economies require knowledge, knowledge expressing activities, and we might decide, you know, through some sort of external measure, what activities are knowledge intense. So we say, well, heart surgeons, you know, need to go to school for a long time. Garbage collectors don't. So basically, we're going to say that the economies that have a lot of hard surgeons and software engineers, you know, are going to be more knowledge intense than the ones that don't. But the problem with these approaches is that in some way, we don't have a principal way to measure the knowledge in an economy. We're assuming the answer, you know, by either taking a proxy or by, you know, classifying the activities as knowledge intense or not ourselves using intuition. So what we can do instead is say that, look, economists have knowledge and knowledge gets expressed in activities. I think nobody should contest that. That's, that's a, a relatively um, general assumption. You know, like you have a mine, you know, the mine might not be there because there was knowledge. It might be there because there was mineral. But once the mine is there, you know that someone there knows about mining. Okay. So knowledge gets expressed in activities. And we can try to figure out which activities are knowledge intense or not, you know, based on the geographic distribution of those activities. So we're not going to assume which activities are knowledge intense or not. We're going to try to infer it based on the geographic distribution, based on those patterns. So what I'm going to say is that we can derive a formula to measure the knowledge intensity of economies and activities. And the way to derive this formula is the following. We're going to say that, look, knowledge intense economies are those involving knowledge intense activities. So I'm going to say that Paris, Milan, Tokyo, New York are knowledge intense if they do knowledge intense things. That's the first part of the formula. Now you might ask yourself, well, what are knowledge intense things? Well, knowledge intense things are the ones that are done in knowledge intense places. So I'm gonna say that biotech is knowledge intense if it occurs in cities that are knowledge intense like Boston and San Francisco and Paris. So you see I produce a circular argument. You know, I'm saying that knowledge intense economies are those that are involved in knowledge intense activities. And I'm saying that knowledge intense activities are those performed by knowledge intense economies. So I can actually now use this logic to create a self-consistent equation. So I'm gonna say that the knowledge K of location C is equal to the average knowledge of the activities present in it. You know, so MCP is a matrix that just tell me which activities are present where. I'm gonna say that the knowledge of an activity is the average knowledge of the locations where this activity is present, okay? And basically I put the second equation on the first one and I get a self-consistent equation for this variable K sub C which is an eigenvector that I can solve and I can basically deduce the knowledge intensity of a location or of an activity just from the spatial distribution of locations and activities. So that's sort of like the big, big, you know, discovery here. You know, that you don't need to assume those proxies. You can deduce measures of knowledge intensity from the spatial distribution of economic activities. And that's the economic complexity index. So here you have a map you know, of the knowledge intensity of activities. You see that there's a lot of knowledge intensity in Japan, in Germany, in the United States, in China, you know, and there's little in Africa and so forth. And what is interesting about this map is that even though, you know, it correlates, you know, with income, it goes beyond that. Actually, I'm going to show you that it predicts future economic growth. So the places that are more knowledge intense than their current level of income tend to grow actually faster than the places that are less knowledge intense, you know. Uh, this also finding that has been generalized to a lot of geographies and activities. Here's, you know, a, a paper by uh, Baland and Rigby. They use patent data for US MSAs, you know, and they use this technique to measure the knowledge intensity of, you know, uh, cities in the United States based on their patent portfolios using this technique of economic complexity. You know, here you have uh, another paper by Fritz and Manduk in regional studies 
uh, they use in this case employment data for US counties to deduce the economic complexity of these different counties. Here you have a paper by uh, Diane Coyle and, and Penny Milley uh, using this technique in the UK to identify you know, the knowledge intensity of different places in the UK. You know in these maps that you know, these measures are very spatially correlated. You know, they, they define very smooth patterns. And that's actually something that I, I find very interesting because they tell us this is about a quantity that is diffusing in space, like knowledge. Actually, the spatial autocorrelation of these measures of economic complexity is much higher than those of income. Because in income, a country that has a lot of you know, natural resources like Qatar can be very high with low knowledge intensity. But in knowledge intensity, basically, you know, since this is based on the portfolio of activities that you're able to produce, you know, we find this spatial correlation that tells us, well, this is about the diffusion of knowledge around Manchester, around you know, the, the Southeast, around London and so forth. Uh, here's a paper you know, using data from China. You know, in this case, they use data of public listed firms in Chinese uh, stock exchange, you know, and they also are able to identify you know, uh, the economic complexity. And here we have you know, uh, from the Observatory of Economic Complexity and in my latest review in Nature Review Physics, you know, maps of economic complexity for Spain, where you see the industrialized North, it's more complex than the agricultural South, Brazil, where Sao Paulo shows up there uh, quite brightly as a knowledge intense location compared to you know, the Amazon and the North and, and so forth. So economic complexity has a few interesting things. The first one is that it predicts future economic growth. So countries that have higher levels of complexity per unit of GDP per capita outgrow those that have you know, a low levels of economic complexity given their GDP per capita. In some sense, you know, like uh, income is in equilibrium with, with this measure of knowledge intensity. And if you have excess of knowledge, you know, you're going to grow faster. If you have a deficit of knowledge, you're going to grow slower. This is a finding that has been reproduced a number of times because our first um, publication about this was in 2009. And since then, it has been reproduced by people in different parts of the world using data at the subnational level, using international trade data, and using other sources of information. You know, uh, also, economic complexity is very robust at explaining uh, you know, future economic growth. You know, it beats measures of education, it beats measures of institution, and so forth. But economic complexity also explains variations in income inequality. And it's actually quite good at it. You know? uh, countries that tend to have uh, higher levels of economic complexity tend to have lower levels of income inequality. So in that chart here, I highlight Chile and Malaysia because these are two countries that if you look at them in terms of you know, traditional macroeconomic variables, GDP per capita or years of schooling, you know, they're quite similar. You know, they would have the same human capital, they would have the same current level of income, but they have very different productive structures. Malaysia you know, is a more knowledge-based economy involves in, in, the, in the manufacturing of electronics. Chile is a more extractive economy. And it is this different economic complexity what is able to explain most of the difference in inequality. You know, it's actually a very strong predictor of inequality. And more recently, it has been a growing literature you know, that, especially in the last couple of years, have been a lot of papers on this that have shown that economic complexity also you know, helps explain you know, uh, the emission intensity of economies. So economies that are more complex, they require, you know, less emissions to produce a unit of GDP, okay? So they have a cleaner GDP. You know, so this is really interesting because now we have a method that allows us to figure out what is the knowledge intensity of an economy based on the spatial distribution of economic activities and helps explain inclusive green growth which is a lot of the things that we're looking for right now. We're looking, of course, you know, for an economy that is inclusive and that is green, but also you know, we understand that we need growth you know, to uh, still happen. You know, we cannot have an economy that doesn't have any growth. We want better growth. You know, we want growth that is green, that is inclusive, you know, but we need growth nevertheless, because there's still a lot of people that live in, in conditions that are, that are quite tight. So this third law, the third law of knowledge intensity, tell us that you know, knowledge intensity can be measured you know, from the spatial distribution of economic activities as is associated with inclusive green growth. So I'm gonna conclude by going back to Yachai. Yachai was a beautiful you know, idea. You know, it was a well-intentioned project, I believe. You know, and, and there were a lot of people that were very excited about it. I, I have a longer presentation in which I actually go through some of the quotes of people in top universities in the United States or other leaders in Latin America praising the project as this revolutionary idea that everybody should follow. 
But as an idea, you know, uh, even though it was beautiful, it was naive because it was the idea to build a city of knowledge in the middle of nowhere, you know, where of course, high-tech companies are not gonna move into because high-tech companies know the importance of being located in clusters where they, they pull talent and they have access to those type of, you know, resources and, and, and ecosystems, you know? And, you know, uh, it was hard to build, it was hard to generate even a important university in that space because, it's not just about money, you know, there are a lot of things that money can buy and these ecosystems that generate knowledge are one of them. The thing is that going forward, we should acknowledge these laws when we're thinking about policy, we should think about how knowledge grows in time, how knowledge diffuses in space and how it accumulates. You know, and these three principles, the principle of experience, the principle of knowledge diffusion and the principle of intensity are a first step in that direction. Thank you. Thank you. Cesar, when do you have to leave to teach? Do we have time for any questions? 441 at 450. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, wonderful. And um, if you have a question, could you please you raise your virtual hand? Because if I don't see any, I will take the liberty of asking one. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you. So I was um, intrigued by the argument that more complex economies that have more a larger knowledge base reduce inequality. Since I'm American and I uh, am from the Bay Area, uh, Silicon Valley seems to have increased inequality very drastically. And so I'm wondering how you're measuring the um, are you how you're measuring that relationship and whether you're doing it within a country or within subunits or or uh, can you tell us yeah. more so that, that's a good question you know so uh, this is also one of these um, problems that depends on the scale so when you look at it you know at an international scale economic complexity tends to be associated with lower levels of inequality so you know, a country like the United States that is very unequal. I'm an American citizen too, and I've, I've been there for many, many years. And it's a country that is, you know, very unequal, but it's not Peru unequal. It's not Venezuela unequal. You know, it's not Pakistan unequal. So internationally, you have that relationship. But when you go within a country, you have other effects. Within a country, you have a spatial equilibrium, you know? So within a country, large cities like the United States, San Francisco, they attract also a lot of people and inequality is very large, you know, within those large cities. So what you have here is something that we believe what's going on is like a Simpsons paradox, that between countries, you know, as complexity grows, inequality decreases. But within countries, inequality increases with complexity, meaning that the largest cities, the Paris, the New Yorks, the San Francisco's of the world are large and unequal within those countries compared to the relatively smaller cities compared to the Syracuse's and the Rochester, you know, uh, of the world. Let me turn on the light again, sorry. <laughs> and, and we have some evidence about uh, the Simpson paradox. The problem is that it's very hard to collect uh, international data that has some national re resolution for multiple countries at the same time. You know? So we can get data for the US with Nikes and for Mexico using Nikes for industries. But when we go to Europe, we have a different classification, you know, and that's a little bit like, so the only thing that we can do here is, is, is maybe use patents, you know, uh, as a, but patents also are very bad measure for countries that patent little. So it's, it's very biased towards a selected group of countries. So that's a very interesting answer. I, I, we're going to rush forward. Sophie. Yes, thanks a lot. I'm, uh... Sophie van Honecker, I'm a fellow at the moment here at the, at the Institute. I know you are probably an economist looking at more the economics of, uh, of learning. I'm working on institutions, organizations, especially on the European Union. Could you also see um, your model being applied on organizations? Mm. So first of all, I'm a physicist by training. So I, <laughs> but I have worked in economic development for like about 15, 16 years. So I know the language by now. Um, but I'm, I'm technically a natural scientist and I'm interested in the natural science of knowledge in a way which, you know, the application is in economics. 
Um, for organizations, I think this can be used in different ways. On the one hand, the, the EU is already using these ideas because for many years they have been pushing this idea of a smart specialization and they require regions to have a smart specialization strategy, you know, and they need to update that smart specialization strategy with a certain frequency. But they don't tell them what a smart specialization is, how to measure it, and how to identify the strategy. So there is a, 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 like a, a growing consulting industry that uses these methods of economic complexity to generate those smart specialization plans for regions in Europe, because uh, all of these methods have been become the default quantitative way to implement a smart specialization strategy, you know? So in some way, you know, it has been used uh, at that level. Then maybe your question is more about, can you use these methods to measure the complexity of organizations, like more at an organization or a firm level? And I think there's some of the assumptions, you know, break, you know, and you would have to be careful because uh, firms have a pressure to specialize that, countries do not you know so if you look at the at even like you know the bay area you know uh, there's a lot of specialization you know apple is great at hardware and operative systems and you know phones you know but they don't do search they don't do social you know they have some cloud but you know but if you look at now the whole ecosystem the ecosystem is always much more diverse than the firm and when you're looking at these measures of economic complexity, in some sense, you are exploiting a little bit kind of like that ecosystem level uh, uh, characteristics that firms might lack. You know, firms can be very specialized. So a firm can be very sophisticated, but, but it's doing one thing, you know, that in the ecosystem view is contributing something that is very unique. You know, you might be kind of like the, the leader in blockchain and that happens in very few places, you know, uh, but at the firm level, you are actually quite monothematic, you know? So, so I, I do think that it's not trivial to simply apply these methods with firm level data. I would say that once you go down, you know, uh, in the scale, you go to city level data and that's, uh, after that, you, you have to start thinking again. Thanks a lot. I think it's very useful. And I think it could also be useful as a starting point for me to better think what are the differences and not. So, but yeah, I very much liked your, your, your model, I must say. Thanks. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to read a question aloud from Philip Hans Pak, who doesn't have a mic. He would like to ask if there is anything surprising or counterintuitive about these findings. These three laws about knowledge seem to me to be pretty much like conventional wisdom about knowledge diffusion. Okay, so thanks. And this is the last question that I'm, I'm going to take. So I think, uh, of course, after you know the story, everything is obvious, but you know, uh, I, I, I wonder if before the presentation, I would have everyone, you know, ask a, a series of questions, say like, what is the functional form, you know, that knowledge at the individual level follows, you know, would they have guessed the right type of functional form and the right powers, you know, uh, when I talk to people in my class and, you know, uh, these are people at the PhD level and I ask them, well, how come, you know, you have Moore law, you know, Moore's law that, growth is exponential with that precise functional form in a world in which they know that at the team level, uh, knowledge growth is limited and forms a power. And I can leave that question hanging for half an hour and they don't get it. You know, uh, when it comes to measuring the um, um, spatial distribution, like the, the knowledge intensity of economies using the spatial distribution of economic activities, you know, getting the right, you know, uh, formulation for that self-consistent equation, I, it's, it's not trivial, you know, and actually, you know, has been something that uh, a lot of people have tried to find alternative formulas and everything. And surprisingly, you know, that formula find first is, is very robust and, and every other tries something, you know, a variation of it gets to, at the end, a similar result, you know? Uh, it's, it's hard to get something uh, that different from that, but. But that was to me not obvious that you can get you know, a, a measure of knowledge intensity by calculating the eigenvectors of a matrix of similarity of you know, a, 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 the productive structure of locations. You know? So I do think that there's, there's a lot of things there you know, uh, that are counterintuitive. And if they would be so intuitive, why there is Yachai? Why there is Mazda? Why Saudi is now building Neom? Why are all of these projects that ignore these laws? If these laws are so intuitive, 
You know, we should see a world that, that would behave according to that intuition. You know, but the big motivation of this is that that is not the case. You know, uh, a lot of projects, you know, don't follow that intuition. A lot of projects think that they can force the creation of knowledge, you know, by political will and financial power. And that doesn't seem to be the case. You know, you have to respect the knowledge uh, laws and you have to understand their specificities because a small difference in these coefficients can sometimes have big consequences when you start compounding things over time. Cesar, thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy day to do this. Thank you, Miriam. I'm sorry I have to run, but it was a pleasure to meet all of you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So just to remind everyone, the next talk is January 12th. And the, uh, oh, thank you. Uh, and the hackathon is December 16th. And please feel free to contact me in particular if you have any questions about the hackathon. Ken Benoit will be also organizing another three hackathons in 2022. So we have a lot of time together. Bye.